Ever feel like you're doing this teaching thing alone? You don't have to be. Share Teaching is all about sharing the workload through the power of collaboration and teamwork. Together, we'll walk through all the difficult parts of teaching and learn how to streamline our processes, fine tune our time management, and develop a more manageable workload. If that sounds like a dream come true to you, then welcome to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Let's share in the teaching to make those dreams a reality. Now here's today's Shared Teaching. Hello, you are listening to the Shared Teaching Podcast. I'm your host, Susan, and I want to say a big welcome to any new listeners. If you are new around here and this is your first episode, I hope you'll go ahead and give some of the back episodes a try, especially if you like hearing about and you might have some struggles with writing. I am big on talking about how to get primary writers writing and how that can look in your classroom rather than just unpopular opinion writing prompts. So don't get me started on those. Today's episode is all about parent volunteers. So again, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. And February is the best time, I believe, to get started with something new in your classroom if you haven't tried it yet, especially if you're a United States teacher, because we've been here chugging along a little bit, and we are more than halfway through the school year. Many of you are celebrating the 100th day, or you already have a couple weeks ago. And so this is just the perfect time to kind of sit back and reevaluate your classroom and your systems and see how things are going and try to implement something new. And today's something new is parent volunteers. So don't get me wrong, even the most seasoned veterans like myself are intimidated by the idea of getting started with parent volunteers. Every year, the pulse of the parents kind of change, and you never know what kind of group of parents you're going to get. Super helpful, very standoffish, nitpicking about everything, helicopter parents, like you never know. So that can always be a little bit scary. But once you find those few parents that, you know, are the ones that are the first ones to read your message, they want to talk to you personally after school every day. I like those kind of parents, right? They're involved. Those are the parents that are going to also want to volunteer and help out with their child's education in some small way. And even if they're not responding to messages or they're not there to meet you right after school, that also doesn't mean they're not involved either. It's just their involvement might look a little bit different, especially if their work schedules kind of clash with the school schedule. So using parent volunteers has tons of benefits for your classroom that are going to outweigh that intimidation factor, especially since most administration love when you have parents working as partners, and it can really make a positive difference in your classroom, especially when you have those students where you're like, hey, your mom or dad's coming in today, help out. They're going to be on their best behavior, right? (laughs) Because they know (laughs) if they're not they're going to get direct line communication about it immediately that day. Okay, so when you're getting started with classroom volunteers, you can get started any time of the year, but if you're a new teacher, it can be overwhelming to try to start with volunteers right from the start, and that is okay. The way your classroom looks, and I've said this before, doesn't have to mimic what everyone else's is looking like. Social media can be a very powerful influencer of that anxiety and that need to keep up and be Pinterest worthy, but it's okay if you're not. I am not one of those teachers and I have to let go with maybe things like anchor charts and bulletin boards. Those are just things that are not in my wheelhouse and probably at this point never will be. And so they're not going to look like everyone else's, right? So just make peace with yourself that it's the way it is. That is your classroom. And that is A-OK. So sometimes when you're getting started, it can be really tough getting organized or feeling like you just aren't ready for volunteers yet. 
But if you keep having that, oh, maybe not yet, maybe next week, and you just keep pushing it off, before you know it, the end of the school year is going to be here, and you didn't even give it a try. So I really urge you, when you feel ready, it's going to be the perfect time to get started. I can help walk you through what you need to do, and it's, it's simple, I promise. The first step you want to do before you start Classroom Volunteers is to actually brainstorm a list of all the things that you think they can do to help. So I just sat down and quickly wrote out a list, and it didn't take me long at all. I just thought of what are the things that I do that's pretty repetitive in my classroom that a parent could come step in and kind of take over that job. So things like making copies, filing papers, doing those painful one-to-one assessments, you know the type I'm talking about, right? So I have like a coin assessment that's like that, and then I have words their way, spelling inventories, I have my regular sight word spelling program, there's a core phonics thing my district has us do, so there's tons of one-on-one assessments that can take a really long time, and I administer them several times throughout the year. Also, spelling, right? Just having them come over and read you sight words to see which words are missing and not, or doing a quick running record. If you can train a parent to do those kind of things, they are a godsend because you free up so much time. And then you can really get into working with your small groups instead of just pulling kids one by one. Anyway, moving on. (laughs) Cutting out laminating, preparing for laminating, and by that I mean... And I'm one of those people that I like it to be very particular and sealed around the edges. So cutting out each piece that needs to be laminated before you laminate it, instead of just sticking like the whole piece of paper in there and then cutting out the laminate later, because I find that the edges tend to peel. So preparing things for laminating, maybe stapling booklets. I am so sad but I have not worked with a copier that staples and folds booklets for me in probably a decade. If you have one of those, oh my goodness, you better hug that copier every day because I do not have that anymore and I'm so sad about it. My friend and I reminisce about the good old days when we had the copier that you could literally put staples in there and it would fold up your little decodable readers It was like a godsend. It made it so fast and easy. But now I am folding and stapling and it's not fun. So parents can do that for you. You send it home. You give a set of instructions and they will send it back to you. Or if they come into your room and do that for you. The other thing they can do is sight word groups. I kind of touched briefly on that. So you're pulling them. They're pulling a group of kids at the same sight word. Maybe they're doing flashcard drills. Maybe they're pointing out the phonics skills in there. If you're following the science of reading, there's many things that they can do as a sight word group. And that's probably a whole different episode topic I could touch on later. There's word study groups. I do those as well, which comes from those words their way inventories that I talked about. They could pull kids aside and do science demonstrations So maybe you're doing something else with the rest of the class and they just have a small table in the back and they're pulling them and showing them a science demonstration and then maybe they're going and working on the lab paperwork afterwards. They can help you prepare centers. There's a ton involved if you have a lot of little moving pieces for your centers. They can help manage centers. So maybe during centers time, they're coming in and they're watching how the students are rotating through and their voice levels and how they're getting along and actually doing the centers. They can be a second pair of eyes for something like that. They can help you put together things like birthday bags if you do those. They can label things, especially if it's the beginning of the year or even now when things are getting kind of worn and you want to like replace some things and change them out. They can stick those labels on everything, number things for you. I do student numbers. They can help you organize things in the classroom. So maybe you have just a corner that you just can't get to. This is kind of like me. My coat rack has a shelf on it, and I just pile all kinds of things there because it's like right by the door. It's easy and convenient. They could kind of manage that for me or pull things out of my giant cabinet, and I only have one and kind of reorganize that too, because what happens is I tend to just open the door, chuck something in and close it, and hope nothing falls. (laughs) And then I just never seem to have the time to properly open it up and reorganize it like it used to be. 
um, they can come and read to the class. They could be either mystery readers or they can just pull aside a, a group of kids. If you have higher readers that are doing like a book club, that's an excellent time to have a parent volunteer just kind of listen in as the students read and kind of help them out as they're working mostly independently as a book club. Remember, I teach second grade, so they're kind of independent but still need some extra hands-on help. This would be perfect for a parent volunteer. And then the last thing I have is one we're probably mostly familiar with is helping set up bulletin boards which are my nemesis. I don't know why I hate them so much. My sister's the complete opposite. She's not a teacher, but she works in a school district. She loves bulletin boards. Like she will come with the ruler and measure it. Everything's perfect and straight and beautiful. And I'm just like, slap it up there. It's crooked. I don't care. I, you know, I just, the faster I can get a bulletin board up, the happier I am. Okay. So make your like big list of everything that a classroom volunteer could do if they came into your classroom to help. And I'm sure as I was talking, you probably thought of some more things that I didn't even think of. And then the next step is also that parents do not have to come to the school. So this is not really a step, I guess. It's just another section of what I'm going to talk about. So I often don't like a lot of parents in my classroom. Shocking, I know, right? But I do like to have them volunteer from home. If you want me to send you things, I am so happy to send you things because that is another way of volunteering. And a lot of parents are really happy to do that, especially if their work hours, like I mentioned earlier, kind of clash with the school hours. Maybe they're working longer in the evening, their kid is in after school care, and they just don't have a chance to stop by the school, see or anything like that. So being able to participate in some small way, they really actually like that. And they like that they're giving that opportunity. Some of them, not always, of course, but I personally, that's my favorite to send materials home to parents because many parents want to volunteer, but maybe they don't know how, or they don't know that that's even an option. So most of what I send home are going to be things that need to be laminated, cut, labeled, or organized. One year, just a couple years ago, I had a very trustworthy parent, and I sent home my personal laminator, my little scotch laminator, with all my laminating sheets, with the color copies that I needed laminated, and she laminated it for me. So she did all my Play-Doh mats and there's like 220 Play-Doh mats because of that's how many Dutch words there are. And she took it home. She sat in front of the TV, she said. She just laminated all that for me, brought it back to me. And she's pretty meticulous like I am when it comes to things being, you know, straight and neat and whatever. So she was the perfect person for that job. So if you have a parent that is like that, that you can really trust and you want them to do those kind of jobs that you know if it was messed up, you'd have to redo it. Pick that parent (laughs) to do that that with, okay? Because I tell you, it saved me so much time. I was so thankful. And I trusted her enough to give her my personal laminator and it came back in one piece. Okay, so another year, we had a new phonics program at my school and it had tons of little pieces right that had like perforations and we had to like separate them and it was just a daunting task like we got it like probably I don't know it was like February maybe this time of year imagine that and then um, we had to like take it all apart file it all that and there was not enough hours in the day so I reached out to parents and I had several parents that volunteered and said yes they would help me with that so I just like put stacks of them in those big manila envelopes with a copied instructions. And I think I sent it home to like four or five parents. And then they all came back with those cards exactly the way I needed it. I was able to put them in the right order and file. And then I had them for when I need them. And the whole rest of the year was done for me. And it didn't take much time, right? So you just have to plan ahead though. Because if it's something you're going to need right away... I hate to say this, but some parents won't get it back to you by a deadline. So make sure whatever you're sending home, you don't need it for at least a couple weeks to kind of give you some wiggle room to like follow up with them and like ask them again, like, hey, how's that going? I kind of need it in a nice, you know, friendly way because they're helping you out. But just keep that in mind that 
Sometimes the urgency factor, it might have to be you doing it. Okay, so another thing is if you're trying to create writing or math toolkits, why not send all the materials and the supplies home with a student or two? And then, of course, I would recommend sending a complete kit home for a sample so the parents could look at that and replicate it because parents do love to help out and they kind of get to get like a little glimpse about what their child's using in the classroom. And I think they kind of like that insider factor, right? Okay, so other things, and I might have mentioned some of these already about volunteering at home that parents could do is making those booklets or packets, right? Just send them home the photocopies, maybe with a sample booklet on top. Um, Put your staples in and your stapler in there with them. Hopefully not your favorite one, just in case you don't get it back. And you want to maybe have them label items. So again, send them like a stack of the folders with like the sticky labels, that you have, you know, put through the printer and show them an example of what it's supposed to look like. And then they can sticker all the things. Laminating, right? Send them home with the personal laminator and the laminating sheet so that they don't have to find any supplies. And it's just easy for them to, like I said with the other parent, she said, I just popped in front of the TV. So set them up with that. Give them the instructions on how to use it. Cutting things out. Again, be very specific about how exactly you want things cut. Um, I like to make sure if they're cutting out laminate, say, hey, leave that edge around there so it stays sealed. Tracing items. Maybe if you do a lot of crafty kind of stuff and the kids need to trace things, and I might be dating myself because I don't think we do too many of this anymore. We just print things on photocopy. But if you happen to have cardboard templates and you trace things out, this would be a good thing for parents to do is give them the cardstock or the, uh, what's it called? colored paper. (laughs) Um, I am forgetful late at night. And then they just trace out the shapes or whatever it is you're using. Creating those toolkits, like I mentioned before, you could have math toolkits, writing toolkits, word study toolkits, um, small group reading table toolkits, whatever floats your boat and things that you want to set up and little kits you want to have made. Ask some parents to do that. Setting up folders or notebooks, maybe use interactive notebooks. This would be excellent for them to like glue in the, you know, table of contents, um, earmark some of those pages. If you're using like half of the book for this and half of it for that, that would be a good idea for parents to work on. Folding papers. So I tend to do a lot of not only double-sided to save on paper, but I also shrink things and I print like four to one on a PDF, so two you know, I shrink down so it's two full size pages, but it's mini size, so it's half size on one sheet, and then you flip it over and there's two more in the back. So really I call it four in one, right? I don't think that's what the copier calls it. <laughs> but folding those up and making like little booklets is what I like to do. Or even creating flashcard sets, right? Especially if you have a lot of students that really need particular words or even like phonics cards and you want each kid to have like their ring with their personal goals on it, then that's something that a parent can do as well. Okay, so then where do you start with parent volunteers? So we talked a lot about what they can do, but where do you even start? So the first place I would start is asking your school office staff or administration about what the policy is in order to have volunteers on campus. Some schools like mine require fingerprinting, background checks, and badges for any visitors that are going to work directly with students. If they're not working directly with students, then my school and district have a requirement of how many hours they they can come in. So that's another thing that you might have a limit to how many times they can actually come in either throughout the month or through the whole year. So checking on that would be a great place to start. And once you know what the school rules are for bringing in your on-site volunteers, then you want to make sure you send home a volunteer sign-up sheet. Now I've done this as Google Forms, a paper copy, so just like a little flyer sent home. I've done it as just a class dojo message saying, hey, who wants to help out? <laughs> so whatever works best for you, whatever's easiest for you. I did see a really cool one recently in someone else's blog post, which I will link into my show notes. And also, if you read this article on shareteaching.com, then you'll be able to see that too. And you just click on that. And they had 
all the lists of what they want the parent to come into their classroom and do. And they had like little check boxes. So they knew very specifically what each parent was willing to do or not do instead of just a blanket, hey, volunteer for me. So I thought that was a really good way to approach it too. Now, don't be afraid to reach out when you have just a specific task, like I have those phonics cards that need parent volunteers. One of the biggest barriers for parents not helping out is they just might not know what they can do. So when you have something very specific in mind, it's easy for them to say yes in order to help. Okay, so last, you want to make sure you are prepared for parent volunteers in the classroom. So that means being organized and ready, which I think is the hardest part of getting started, right? Is what are you going to do with them? Where are they going to sit? But it doesn't have to be that complicated. I have an adult in my classroom all the time because she's a sign language interpreter, and she just pulls up a chair and slides it over to where the student is or slides out of the way in the front of the classroom. So parents that are coming in, they can also make it work. You don't have to have a special little setup for them unless you have a big job that you want them to do, and then you might need to clear out some space for them to work at. But generally, the parents are going to be able to figure it out. They're coming in to help. They would be more than welcome to kind of set up a little space for themselves. So don't feel that pressure that you have to do that for them because many of them, if they're coming in, they're going to be gracious enough that they can also help figure out those things, right? Just kind of smile and apologize. Be like, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure where you would work and what would be more comfortable for you. How about over here or over here? This is what I was thinking. And then maybe they would come up with one of those options or a third option even of where they want to work. So I know many other people have mentioned having parent volunteers help you with grading. And I say avoid that because there are FERPA FERPA privacy policies, try to say that three times fast, where it's student protection right, of their their rights. So you are not supposed to be showing grades out to people that are not that child or the parents that have requested that. So really, it's kind of a a sketchy area. I just wouldn't do it at all. In fact, within my own classroom, I don't even let my students pass out graded work to each other. They only ever pass out like flyers from the office or photocopies for whatever activity we're going to be working on. But it's not things that have been completed and graded because I don't want them to see each other's grades. In fact, I flip them upside down and put them on their tables and I tell them don't share with each other. So that's kind of a big thing for me. So I would just recommend avoiding having parents help you with grades. Um, There's another way you can set up and be organized, and that is to have a bucket labeled volunteers. And I had a teammate that did this, and it worked really well for her. So literally just a big tub she found at like the Dollar Tree or something, and she labeled it like volunteers. And then she put like, you know, folders and stuff inside. And so the volunteers that came, they knew I'm going to look in that bucket. Okay, I always work on these sight word assessments with you know, this group of students. So it had like the list of students with paper clipped on the front of the file folder and the papers that they would need inside the file folder. And that was in the bucket. If they were going to read to a certain group of students, the book was in there, you know, so things like that, where if the teacher was busy, the parent just comes in and looks for that bucket and reads the directions and hopefully can get started without any interruptions. And just it's very smooth transition for all. So having parent volunteers in your classroom doesn't have to be just another thing to add to our plates. I really want to have you have the mindset of thinking of it as an opportunity to get help with some of the repetitive tasks that you just don't have time for. So if you liked this episode and you have a favorite thing that you like parent volunteers to do that I might not have mentioned, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts and tell me what that is. What do you like parent volunteers to do? Have you even started with them yet? Are you going to try after listening to this episode? I would really love to know. You can also drop me an email at susan at shareteaching.com. And I personally respond to anyone that writes me. And I love hearing from listeners like you. So thanks again for listening. And I will see you next week.
Bye for now. If you've loved this show, then join me in sharing the teaching, hitting that subscribe button, and leaving us a review on iTunes so we can be found by more teachers like you who are ready to start sharing the workload. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Find new episodes each week on shareteaching.com. Thanks for listening to the Share Teaching Podcast.